Today, I am super excited to have William Peters on the show. William is the founder of the Shared Crossing Project, whose mission is to positively transform relationships to death and dying through education and raising awareness about shared crossings and their healing benefits. As the director of the Shared Crossing Research Initiative, William and his team collect and study extraordinary end of life experiences which are called shared crossings. William is a global leader in shared death studies and end of life phenomenon. He's developed methods to facilitate the shared death experience and to assist experiencers in meaningfully in integrating and integrating their experiences. William is a psychotherapist at the Family Therapy Institute of Santa Barbara, where he specializes in end of life counseling as a means towards psycho-spiritual evolution. He's done a lot more serving as a hospice worker, and he's had two NDEs, and he's presented in many places. And today, I want to talk about the Shared Crossing Project and his beautiful new book. Oh, it's just amazing, At Heaven's Door. So welcome to the program, William. Thank you, Marla. Good to be here. It's so nice to, it's so nice to have you here. You know, I, I say often that I think that um, near-death experiences are are going to change the world. I say that about I say that about psychedelics too. <laughs> I don't like the word psychedelic, but um, but this work that you're doing is going to change the world and how we can help those who are transitioning. So let's talk about it. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in all of this. Yes. Well, I have to say that, you know, it's hard to, it's hard for me to imagine that um, at a, as a young man, or even, you know, as a child, or, that I could ever imagine doing what I'm doing for a living. Mm -hmm. So, so really, it started with uh, my first near-death experience. Uh, at 17 years old, just a, you know, typical kid out skiing with friends, and I had a really horrible accident. Uh, I crushed my spine on a bad fall and was catapulted out of my body. I had no idea what had happened to me at the time, but I was sailing away from my body. I could see my body on the ski slope. I could see you know, Lake Tahoe, which is right next to the ski area. And then, then became enamored. I mean, very enthralled and sublime feelings uh, that were accompanying this experience. And I didn't realize as I was watching my life uh, pass before me in a movie of snippets of everything I'd ever done, mm -hmm. didn't realize uh, until I saw the light that I was dying or that I, in some ways you could say that I had died. Um, and when I saw the light, Unlike so many near-death experiencers, I did not want to die. As pleasant, as divine as this experience was, I was very clear that I did not want to die. And when I saw the light, uh, I grew up Catholic. So I, I, I immediately said, God, I do not want to die. I did not complete what I incarnated in this lifetime to do. I don't even know where that knowledge came from within me, but that's what I said to God. And I hung out in this, in the light with God, very much at peace, very calm, but I wasn't, you know, my resolve to return did not uh, waver. And after some time, I felt a pushback on me and I started moving away from the light and heading back to what I assume was going to be planet Earth. And in that moment, I heard, make something of your life. And I just made my way back to that body. I must say, when I was returning, you know, through that vast solar system, I couldn't even see planet Earth when I first started back. But I, I realized I was being guided at some point. First, I was nervous. How am I going to get back? I was like, whoa, this, you know, I'm in the middle of nowhere here, man. Right. Um, but eventually I realized, oh, there's some sort of pull here, some sort of uh, magnetic, electrical 
thing that's guiding me back. So I came back in my body in that ski slope. And I didn't think about that experience at all. But it changed me unconsciously, uh, in part because I mean, I, had, I experienced a great deal of physical pain and limitation. I was an athlete previous to that. After that, I was never able to run again, uh, rarely played any sports. And if I did, I was in a great deal of pain. And so uh, for a 17 year old boy, young man to take that on, uh, as I look back, I'm a psychotherapist. I realized that was a complete uh, annihilation of my identity mm -hmm. so in the way of making sense for that i found myself interested uh once again unconsciously in being with people who suffered and so i ended up taking a position right after college in central uh, in belize central america teaching school at the time it was a very Belize was just received their independence. They were all British Honduras. So the, it was an early uh, nation of independence, very poor. There was one, I think two paved roads and one stoplight in the country when I arrived there. Uh, and I was teaching high school and I loved it. I was just, I, I still think it's one of the best years of my life. But from there I went to Guatemala uh, and then to Peru and always working with poor, the poor in different ways, whether they were refugees or teaching in schools. I was part of, I was working with it in the Jesuit missions, which is a liberal arm of the Catholic church. So um, not proselytizing, I had no interest in proselytization. I was more interested in just helping and learning from people. And, and but it was hard living down there. I was in two civil wars uh, in both Guatemala and in Peru. Uh, so saw a lot of pain and suffering, a lot of famine, uh, you know, just all the things that come from, you know, situations that are violent and lacking in resources and oppression. So those experiences shaped me a great deal. Um, I should also say it was there that I met the sh some you know the I was working with the Aymara community in southern Peru uh, and these are indigenous people that are largely they've come down from the highlands uh, the Andes Andes plain they called it the Altiplano the highlands in Peru and it was there that I got uh, exposed to uh, shamanism in this sense that you know we journey we have these human lives but you know we can journey in our I don't think they call it a soul body, but some aspect of ourselves travels and can leave this body and goes on even after death. And that was, you know, very um, familiar to me. And I think it was because of my near-death experience. I think, well, that makes sense. There just wasn't any cognitive dissonance with me. There wasn't any resistance to that. Whereas most of the Catholics around me and were like, oh, that's just that, you know, primitive pre-modern stuff and for me it was like oh, really why why would you say that that you know but I didn't really know why I was that um you know open but I'm sure it was the near-death experience because I didn't really have anything else that would predispose me to that appreciation for what they were saying but when I came back from Peru I Took a job in the tenderloin of san francisco which is a very poor part of san francisco skid row and the what we now call the aids epidemic broke out and it was there that i was working with many men dying of the hiv virus and they were on the margins and so as a social worker they would come to me for for food and emotional support, since we had a big soup kitchen at the St. Anthony's Foundation where I was working. But I developed relationships with a variety, with a variety, with a lot of these uh, men. And, and so I started hearing about these spiritual experiences at the end of life, lots of them. But there was one in particular that really caught my attention. It was in large part because I knew um, Brad was a kind of 
what we might want to call a psychopomp uh, today. He was a person who was maybe a death midwife or a doula. He knew he was always helping his community of what he called brothers, uh, uh, an encampment of homeless gay men living in a burned out building. He helped the dying there. He guided, you know, these men through their transitions, which was not uncommon in these days because this population was on the margins. And so I had this relationship of trust with, with Brad and he came in one morning and I looked at him and he looked just beleaguered, wiped out. And I said, Brad, I said, what's up? I said, you just look, you know, tell me what's going on. He goes, oh, Randy died last night. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. He goes, yes, I am too. But, but it was a beautiful death. I said, it was a beautiful death. Tell me. Because, you know, in those days, dying of HIV virus, these were yeah. ugly deaths, you know, carposa sarcoma, lesions on your body, difficulty breathing. I mean, this was bad. This, you know, we didn't have what we have today to help um, the persons with HIV. So, and, and imagine no medical assistance either. So he goes on to say to me, yes, you know, we were gathered around him. The brothers were gathered around him. And as he was dying, a cylinder of light came down and he moved up that, that cylinder of light and he stopped just above us, looked down at all of us and said, thank you to each of us for caring for him. And he looked younger and healed and radiant and happy and he was off. And I thought, oh my God, I had no reason not to believe right. what Brad was sharing with me. But then again, I had had my own experience as uh, my own uh, near death experience. So once again, I think I was predisposed to this. So sometime after that, uh, I had my second near death experience where I was, I contracted a rare blood disease, uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenia, and uh, found myself in the ICU. I was drowning in my blood, very close to death. I didn't know this, but I was hovered above my body in the ICU as a consciousness, just no connection to anything in the ICU that I was aware of until the nurses started talking about this guy in bed four who was healthy and 30 years old and no real history at the Kaiser Hospital. And, but he got ITP, I did a pathic thromocytopenia. I go, well, that's really strange. We go take a look at this guy. And I, mean, I move my consciousness over there and I go, oh my gosh, that's me. That's me. Wow. And, uh, and so um, there's more to that experience. And, and if your viewers are interested, I just encourage you to go to my book because I go into it a little bit more detail. Yeah. But that experience taught me I am not my body. Whatever I identify as myself, it is not my physical body. And so after that experience, once again, I didn't talk about it, but I, I am at this point getting increasingly interested in this experience called death and transition. Uh, and my grandmother on my paternal side was dying a few years later. And as I walked into her room, uh, this would be like a few days before she died. She was carrying out a conversation with her hands stretched out like this. And those of us who work in end of life are very familiar with this uh, behavior, uh, this gesticulating as, in a, as if they're having a conversation with somebody who's either at the end of the bed or in the corner of the room but they're in a bubble of sorts. Like I walked in, she didn't notice me and I realized, well, I'm not gonna interrupt this. But I did start taking notes because I was curious because she was calling out names and telling stories and you know, she was arguing, like, oh boy. And, and I took down all the names. I went back to the elder in our family, my uncle. And I said to my uncle, I said, this is what Nano, you know, my grandmother was talking about. And he says, oh my gosh, those people were in her life 50 years ago. And I was just like, wow. And he, you know, then he knew, he says, you can't, you know, you couldn't be making this up because you weren't even alive. 
And these aren't people we talked about. So I was like, wow, okay. So then I knew something was going on. And you know, some might say, well, she was just having a review of her life. But it didn't feel like that because I could feel and sense these beings in a certain way in the room. I guess I could, it was palpable. It wasn't like she was just reviewing her life. She was engaged with these people and I could feel them. Yes. And so anyway, with that, you know, after that, uh, I committed myself to really learning more about death and dying in a formal way. And I took a position uh, as a volunteer at Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco, which was really and, and remains today one of the most progressive hospices because um, they had the Buddhist principles of presence and um, you know really being mindful and allowing the, the dying to have their experience, to die with dignity and, um, and to support them, but not to do much more. It was really a receptive state of care. So I would find myself like so many of us there, either just at bedside, you know, meditating or meeting their needs, or in my case, in this case, I was reading a story to Ron, call him Ron. And Ron had been a merchant marine in his life. And so he loved adventure stories. And I was reading to him a Jack London story, Call of the Wild. And I'd been doing this for a number of days. And on this particular afternoon, uh, well, I, and, and he had been this way for a number of days, he was what we call um, unresponsive in a semi-coma state, just there breathing peacefully, but making no um, response to anything I said. And so I would just read to him because in hospice, we know that the last sense door to depart is hearing. So I was reading to him, and as I'm reading to him, I pop out of my body, and I am hovered above my body, and I can see myself, I'm looking at myself at my crown, and I can see, you know, me holding the book, and I can see me reading even, and then I can see Ron's body in the bed, unresponsive, and I'm just watching the scene, and then, then I notice on my right is Ron. Ron is in, the, he, he's out of body, like me, very much alive. I see a big smile on his face, wide open eyes, big white teeth and smiling. And he's saying, check this out. Check this out. So I'm a little bit stunned, but comfortable enough because once again, I've been in these places before and just taking it in. So I don't know how long I was there, but it was very comfortable. And there wasn't much communication with Ron, actually. And then sometime later, I was back in my body. And I don't think, I mean, I think these are just two parallel universes. So that, those are the initial experiences. But once again, even at one of the most uh, informed progressive hospices in the world, I went to my supervisor, who I loved. He was a great man, a veteran of hospice for that time, two decades at least. And I told him about my experience. He said, hey, I was with Ron. And you know, all of a sudden, I popped out of my body and da-da-da. And he says, oh, William, you know, all things, all sorts of things happen here. Phenomena rolling by, let it go. He did say, oh, yeah, halfway between heaven and earth. Yeah, that happens. Hey, phenomena rolling by. Mary needs you in bed for, you know, and uh, and and just kind of dismissed it, uh, which is not an uncommon Buddhist response for most phenomena. Uh, don't hang on to anything. Let it go. Let it roll by. So I did that. And I didn't, but I didn't mention any of these experiences to anybody. And during my time, I had four or five other volunteers working with me there and other staffers. I never mentioned it, but I would have more of these experiences uh, in different kinds of, of shared death experiences. And I, I think I should tell your, you and your viewers, these experiences we're talking about here, these are shared death experiences. This is an experience where somebody dies and a loved one, caregiver or bystander reports that they shared 
in some part of the transition with the dying into an afterlife. And, and, and the term that we see in our research, because now, you know, I'm the director of the Shared Crossing Research Initiative, we now have, you know, 225, 30, probably more cases now, deeply analyzed shared death experiences. Really, now I have a good sense for uh, the features, the varieties, the typology, all of the patterns. I, I think we got this pretty well down now because there, I'm just over and over again, the, re, the repeating of this. So, but once again, at this time, I had no idea what these experiences were that Brad had reported to me and others at that time. Uh, that, and that I was now having at Zen Hospice. But I met Raymond Moody in 2009, which would have been about, yeah, about nine years after working at Zen Hospice. Now, by this time, I am a fully, you know, even when I was at Zen Hospice, I was a psychotherapist, practicing psychotherapist. If not, I think I was training at that time. But by this time, I'm, I'm fully into my psychotherapy yes. practice, specializing in end of life, um, helping a lot of people with spiritual experiences generally. And I, kn I know these experiences when they come into my office, but I didn't have a term for it. I would just go, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that, I've heard of that. I, you know, that's something, don't doubt yourself. I've had them. And I, I know it's in the literature because I read over some of the literature, but that didn't have a name. But Raymond Moody, I see him at a conference and he says, he says, well, I'm going to talk to you about another experience. I know all of you are here to see me talk about the near-death experience. He says, but there's another experience that is almost identical to the shared death, to the near death experience, but it happens when a caregiver or loved one is at the bedside and they have these same NDE like experiences, and those would be an out of body experience or uh, a having a life review. Uh, shared life review. In this case, the SDE would be you share in the life review with the person dying. In other words, you get to see their life review or you have your own life review. There's various uh, iterations of that, by the way, that I go into that in much more detail, uh, both in our academic work and, and in, in the book at Heaven's Door. So, but then there's these other things like, you know, going through a rib tunnel and seeing the light and perhaps the most compelling aspect of the shared death experience. There's really a few, but one is in over half the cases, you see the dying moving along, progressing on a journey into a benevolent afterlife. So there's the main motif of the shared death experience. It's journey of the dying that you get to observe. And the second thing you get to see, or the second thing is that you see these same near death features played out in slightly different ways because you have a different perspective on these experiences. And the, and the third thing that we really want to bring up is the importance of the relationships. It's, they seem to happen when you have a strong bond or a relationship of trust. So you may be saying, well, gosh, William, you're working in Zen Hospice. You have this experience with Ron. You're not a family member. You're not a loved one. Yes, that's true. But what I found, and I know from now researching people who are in hospice, is that oftentimes it is the hospice workers that have the closest relationship with the dying as they're approaching death because family members don't want them to die. Family members are distracted. Family members are stressed out. But the hospice workers and nurses and other loving personnel are saying to them, I'm here for you. You can go, you know, it, yes. you've lived a good life. And so because of that bond that, that, that strengthens right away, um, you know, we say that these people can have these experiences. So that, those are the main, those are some of the main features. And, but I want to bring up one other one. That's just, you know, it's my favorite. And that is, there is this force that seems to be at play in the shared death experience. I call it the conductor. There seems to be this entity that is seen some of the time. Oftentimes it's felt, but not seen. And sometimes in half of our cases, 
we don't even sense or feel it. But my next round of research is going to be looking to see how does this force reveal itself? Or if not, where is it, even though we can't see it? Because when you when you experience the conductor, it's clear that they are in charge of this great transition, this transition of the soul spirit consciousness from the human body into a benevolent afterlife. And, you know, an example of this is, you know, um, Amelia, for example, she is, she's with her 13 year old son who's dying of cancer and he's been battling cancer for three years and at the moment of death she's in bed with him holding him and he's you know struggling breathing and all of a sudden a beautiful woman comes down she describes the most beautiful woman she's ever seen she says to herself oh i have to remember this this woman is so beautiful but she's got some urgency to her she's here to do something she's got intention and then all of a sudden she this beautiful woman um disappears and amelia's like what was that and then she goes oh my gosh she came to get tom my son she knows what the beautiful woman is there for and she looks back at Tom. Tom takes a few more breaths and he's gone. And so and we see this various presentations of the conductor, this beautiful force that, you know, some might call it the Grim Reaper, but it's not so grim. In our experience, this conductor is forceful. Sometimes it comes as a, as a, I have one, you know, oftentimes it's ominous, but, but it's in charge in a good way. So when caregivers, loved ones see the conductor, there are cases we have, there's one case I'll share with you, another one where the conductor appears and a loved one is there, the daughter of this woman, Diana, who's dying of ovarian cancer. It's her mother. And this, this being comes down as she describes it. He's tall, he's commanding, he's, he's big, he comes right over the top of Diana. This is uh, Elizabeth, uh, Margaret's mother. And he looks at Margaret and says, I'll take it from here, step aside. Oh. And then all of a sudden, Margaret watches um, the spirit soul of her mother elevate out of her body. And he pulls her up and that's it, takes her right away. So this is the cutting edge of share death studies and um you know i'm doing it you got a good team and it's great yes i um so i know that these are much more common also than what many think i mean i have a few friends that have had these experiences and in my small little circle you know and and they're not the spiritual friends but they are now so let's talk about that before we get into the workshops that people can take this must transform people's lives who are experiencing that shared death have you have you what have you seen yeah so we you know initially when i was doing this i was noticing as a psychotherapist you know i'm looking working with people in grief and bereavement you know they've lost someone and i started noticing that the persons that i was working with that had the shared death experience had a number of different um, therapeutic benefits shall we say the first being is they would always report like i know my deceased loved one is alive and well mm -hmm. in, a, in a beautiful place 
call it heaven, benevolent afterlife, call it what you like. They just knew they were alive and well. The second thing they'd say is, I know I'm going to see them again. I know I'm going to see them again. And the third thing they'd say is, I'm not afraid of death anymore. I don't have any anxiety or fear about it. When my time comes, I'm going to be ready. And then along with that, that also also say, I know my life has a meaning and purpose here. And I'm here for a short period of time. And I'm going to get about doing that. And then the fourth thing, we, fifth thing we saw, which is really directly related to your question of transformation, is the grief and healing process, the bereavement healing process was radically different for shared death experiencers. You always feel the heartache and loss of, of someone you love when they leave, but they were able to hold it in a greater context imbued with meaning and understanding. They knew that this was the natural path of life. They knew they'd see them again. And they felt often a continuing bond with that person. They felt like, well, that person's alive. And so in a lot of ways, they would be cultivating an ongoing relationship with them, which as a psychotherapist, I work in the model of continuing bonds, which is, you know, how do you continue to nurture a relationship that works for you with someone who's, who's gone? And, you know, you with the loss of your son, probably know what I'm talking about is even though your, your son is no longer in human form, I suspect you have s- some type of relationship with him that is maybe just as deep, just different. And, and so, and I don't maybe putting words in your mouth, but I know that you're a very spiritual person. And um, so, and that's the type of relationship that I, cultivate with people that I work with of all kinds, really, even if they haven't had the shared death experience, because there's other, uh, there's other what we call shared crossing experiences that we also study post-death visions and visitations, uh, post-death synchronicities, uh, and pre-death dreams and visions. So all this stuff we study and, and, um, and deeply analyze. So, it's yes. Inter- it's interesting that you brought that up because today just randomly well i don't believe in things being random but i opened up um some of the letters that i've transcribed through mediums and in this one my son said we'll be much we'll still be mother and son but we'll have a even more a much deeper relationship as souls or something exactly what you Mm. said which is it's um it's so interesting that that you know now you're talking about that i can't think of more of a better gift to give to not only the person who's transitioning instead of people tiptoeing around them and and crying and and which of course you know sometimes you can't help that we're only human but what a gift for, for the dying and yeah. for them. So how can people um, learn how to learn how to do this? And I'm sure many people who don't even have anyone who they think at least in their future is going to be passing, but just uh, just to raise that vibration and to be able to learn to learn these yeah. things. Yeah, so uh... Well, I think the first, well, let me go through what, I, what I've learned is, is the process to really step into uh, preparing for uh, a shared death experience and, and by doing so, enabling one. Uh, now, to be clear, we don't know how the shared death experience happens. This is why I'm very interested in the conductor, see what we can learn from the mechanisms, if you will, that are at play there. Uh, in this, in these transitions, but this is what my, you know, I have, you know, the share crossing project has, has a series of educational courses and trainings. And, and what I learned early on was there are really three steps that, that help people prepare for this. And the first one is really learning about the shared death experience and other end of life experiences, but in particular, the shared death experience, because it is the queen of end of life experiences. It has the most phenomena, it is the most mystical. It's just, it's just awesome. So 
you know, there are various ways to learn about that. And, you know, I just, like I said, you know, you, we have, a, actually, we, at this time, we have a number, I'm teaching a course with Raymond Moody, it's coming up, you know, it's a, yes. actually, there's a free global online summit for people who are interested, just learning about it, and that's all free. And then there's other courses we'll offer in the spring, and, you know, just for those of you who are listening right now, uh, you know, we have a, a shared death intensive, it's not really intensive, it's a comprehensive course on it. It's seven weeks, it really goes into every aspect that we know of about the SDE. Um, and to be, I say that I should be careful. It's really an introductory class, but for the general person, it's really a, a comprehensive study. Mm -hmm. There's certainly more to go into and we'll offer subsequent advanced study. There's that. And, and so, and then there's another program that we'll be offering next fall. We used to offer this all the time in person in Santa Barbara and around the country called the pathway. And this program um, we say it prepares people for a conscious, connected, and loving end-of-life experience, and it teaches uh, the protocols to have a, a, a shared death experience. But that class begins the same way as I, as I said before. The first step is with knowledge, gaining understanding for the shared death experience and other end-of-life experiences, other mystical, transcendental end-of-life experiences. And then we take people through a series of what I call psycho-spiritual exercises, a review of your life, looking for regrets, unfinished business, opportunity to have compassion for yourself, really softening your soul, uh, making men's is where possible with people, working on gratitude for the life you've lived. And even if you're young, I have all sorts of people taking this class. There's always a lot of people in their thirties and forties. And, and then I notice that people ask them, well, boy, you're doing this class pretty early. You know, we're all, you know, getting closer to the end. And they go, why are you taking it? And they always say, well, I'm really curious for one, yeah. but you never know when you're going to die. And I have parents and loved ones who are elderly and I want to, I want to know all about this now. Why would I wait till the end? You know? So, right. so basically the idea is that people of all ages take this class and, and then we go through the life review and then we go, we work out all, we try to work out our psycho emotional um, unfinished business. And we do, you know, forgiveness exercises and all sorts of things like this. So it's psycho spiritual preparation. A lot of this work we've learned you know, I'm a psychotherapist and a yeah. spiritual practitioner. So we know how to do this and we do it in people can do it alone or they can do it in groups. So that's one way. Now I should say we're bringing that program online next fall. So you'll be able to take it next fall. If people are interested um, or probably we'll do some in Santa Barbara starting pretty, you know, we won't do, we won't do one this spring, but anyway, we'll be doing them because um, now we, you know, after the public, our various publications, we're getting a lot of interest and we, our mission is to educate people. So the final step that we teach is these protocols to help people when you're dying, we teach the dying how to go through a death, stay conscious and reach back and call their survive, surviving loved ones to come with them into the afterlife and to have the shared death experience. Mm. And then we teach receptivity on the side of the, of the loved one caregivers, the surviving loved one caregivers. That is, um, that's a training part of the pathway program and part of some of our other programs that's, that's rather intensive, but people love it because yes. we do guided visualizations and we do um, and, you know, meditations and we take people into different states of mind and so yeah, that's what we do. And, and, and that's really what the Shared Crossing Project, it kind of separates us from any other organization is that not only do we know about the SDE, but we've developed methods to teach it and to offer it to other people who want to have it. And we're a growing, we're a growing learning community. So for every person that has this experience in our community, they come back and share with us. We document it, we share with others. We bring community, we bring people around the world uh, increasingly for our various programs and realize that these are happening everywhere. Yes. I remember um, when um, Dr. Moody was on the show, he's been on a few times and 
at the point when he finally said, I give up. And I know you're familiar with Dr. O'Driscoll and yeah. Jeffrey Olson's experience. And, and I think that's really what introduced him to, to that. If it wasn't that, it's when he threw his hands up and said, I give up. There's, there's more you know, yeah. this life continues. And I just love that. So William, um, your alumni, I know you're going to tell us a little story about Larry, what some of them mm. have to say after going through, after going through this program. Yeah. So people have been through the pathway program. Uh, we try to stay in touch with them. Although, you know, some people go off and live their lives and uh, but we, a lot of people share their stories with us at the time of death. So Larry Crandell, he's in the book, uh, was a very well-known man in Santa Barbara. And he took the pathway training with his son. Um, and so Stephen and Larry took the class together. Larry was in his 80s by the time when he was taking this course. And a few years later, Larry's declining. And he's in a, you know, senior home facility. I think by this time he was in skilled nursing. Uh, Stephen had been there, but wasn't there at the time of death. But Stephen's sister was there, Leslie. And uh, his niece, Larry's granddaughter, Sarah, was also at bedside. Just as Larry was dying, both Sarah and Leslie reported a flock of birds like they'd never seen before just kind of just going hysterical outside with joy and presence and flapping and Larry who'd been resting with his eyes closed opened his eyes and smiled and acknowledging the birds and the music they were making closed his eyes and died now Next thing that happens is Leslie reports looking out the window where the birds are. And suddenly she has a vision of Larry walking away arm in arm with his beloved mother and three predeceased siblings. And Larry looks back at Leslie and acknowledges all is well, all is well. And Leslie says, oh my God, I, I said, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, it could have never convinced me of that because she's a bit of a scientist. So that's just one of, you know, hundreds of experiences we have from our alums. Right. Isn't it interesting how the, you, you spoke of shamanism earlier, how the shamanic um, traditions, the indigenous cultures, they know all about this, <laughs> you know, yeah. been, and, and we're finally starting to go back and, and learn, learn from them too. Wow. So can you tell us a little bit about, so you have the programs coming up and how does the scientific community, how are they embracing this? I know a few universities or at least one has gotten involved. Yeah, so let me tell you about the Share Crossing Research Initiative. That's our research arm of the project. And uh, so there's, it's a multidisciplinary team. Obviously, I'm the director and I'm a psychotherapist. So I come at this from a, you know, a clinical psychotherapeutic background as a mental health professional. Uh, then I have a chief of research, Dr. Michael Kinsella, who's uh, a PhD in religious sciences uh, religious studies, I should say, and cognitive sciences. And then we have Dr. Monica Williams, who's an emergency room, emergency department physician, board certified. So really got it covered from, you know, the mental health, uh, physical health, Dr. Monica Williams and Michael, Dr. Michael Kinsella, he brings in kind of the humanities uh, side of things. So we have published uh, in two major uh, academic, one medical journal, the American Journal of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. It's the first uh, medical journal to ever publish on the shared death experience. And it's quite a robust article on our research. Very, been very well, was very well received by the reviewers. Uh, they acknowledge these experiences happen, but there'd never been any research on it to really, you know, 
identify and, right. and document the experience. And then also in the Omega, which is the uh, Journal of Death and Dying, uh, that's the international journal as well, probably the largest in the world. They also, we published there for our spectrum of end of life experiences. And I was alluding to that earlier. These are mm -hmm. the spectrum of end of life experiences, pre-death premonitions, pre-death visions and visitations, terminal lucidity, yes. shared death experiences, post-death visions and visitations, and synchronicities throughout. And I found this in my clinical practice. And then now we use this as the model that we study um, to learn more about these experiences. Right. So, and so that's what the Omega article is about. And that's been very well received as well. Wonderful. That's, that's great. So William, what do you, we need to wrap it up soon. Sure. What would you, um, what would you say to, I know you have a um, young teen, but for a young, not but, and for a young child, if they, knowing what you know now and if they've lost it, had a loved one pass or a pet, what, what would you do to help comfort them knowing what you know now? Yeah. You know, death in our culture is something that we really put on the margins. We don't really have a way to dialogue about it in a way that is honoring that death is a part of, of life. It's, it's, yes. It comes with life. So we have to be very sensitive, especially when we're dealing with kids, because any child that loses a loved one, that in their mind, because of the cultural um, con context for the way we hold it, is an aberrant event that is wrong, that is somehow not correct. It's something happening that's inappropriate. Yeah. And, and so we have to be careful about how we talk about these experiences. One thing I always caution um, my people in my groups is, listen, don't go out and start talking about the shared death experience to people who've lost loved ones as a way to tell them, hey, you know, don't worry about it. I know about the shared death experience. Your loved one's alive and well somewhere. You have to be a bit, a lot more sensitive and, and go, go be more engaging. So um, I do work with children, not, not that much. I would say it's not, my, it's not my specialty at all. There are others who specialize in working with children around death. But I do do it when they're part of, of, uh, of a family situation because I like to bring the whole family together. And one thing I ask is always, you know, what do you, where do you, where do you, what do you think happened? Like here was this beautiful person, whether it's a father, a mother, a brother, a, a grandmother, what have you. Where do you think this person is? Do you think they're still around in some capacity? It's interesting, the younger the child is, the more likely, typically, they're going to say, oh, well, I saw her, or yes. I saw him, or I, she's come to me. And it's as we, as it's just, but when we grow up and get educated in our scientific materialist model that we all live in, in, in the academies of our culture, um, that type of thinking uh, gets drummed out of us. So it's really an assessment, begins with an assessment of where is the child's relations? Where, where are they in relationship to death and dying general? And a loose, I say loose, a very gentle uh, inquiry as to maybe whether they've had any experiences with that person. And if so, what do they make of them? What did that teach them? What are they, what do you make of that, you know? And they usually have a sense of, uh, of understanding about it, right. you know? So, um, but the sad, the sad reality is that a lot of people don't have these experiences as much as we'd like for them to have them. Uh, we just, they're not as prevalent as we think. I would say in my research and that those of us, those of us who study end of life phenomena you know, a third of all people have what we call some form of after-death communication. That's a lot of people, but they don't tend to talk about it. 
My sense is it's higher than that. Um, and so, and it will become higher as we become more familiar with these experiences and allow them to come into our personal lives, but they come in first through our cultural um, context for being legitimate experiences. So I think I'm answering your question rather indirectly, though. I mean, what do you do? It, it is not to talk about these experiences directly, at least initially. It's more to open conversation about right. death and dying and to ask them how they're doing. Like, how, how are you making sense of this? Don't you agree also that it they watch the caretaker, the adult so closely in their lives. Yeah. And if, if one is, is remembering and seeing signs and, and validating the child and not, not coming right out and saying, this is the way it is. And this is what I know, or yeah. I believe, but, but if we could also change our, our actions so it's not so fearful for the child i think that's a big step for us is that you know yes. we need to we, you know this is every family does their their kids um a favor a gift if they can uh emote properly around the and when i say properly that's a little bit judgmental healthily around the loss of someone yes crying yes. and weeping yes all that is healthy but also engagement, with, stay engaged with the family enough, you know. Um, it's hard because death, especially when unexpected and tragic, takes all of us. I mean, there's just, there's no sense of dignity when you've lost a loved one that close and that sudden, as you well know, uh, rips your heart out. And so balancing that experience with uh, how it is that you can stay present for your children, the young ones, is a tough act. Yes. I think we all need to have compassion for ourselves as we go this. One thing I do say to parents when they've lost somebody and, and their kids are looking to them for support or whatever, is that do your heavy emoting in a safe place away from your children but let your children know that you are emoting. Yes, yes. Because um, you don't want your children to get scared for what you're going through and therefore feel the need to take care of you because then they leave their own grief experience behind. Mm -hmm. And that becomes unprocessed grief, yeah. not good. But also what, um, thanks for sharing that. Um, what a be beautiful thing if we started this conversation way before anyone was had passed or you know from the from the very beginning yeah yeah that's the hope is that culturally we wake up and that's the hope for you know here i wrote this book and wrote, it got released just at the end of covid and the idea was you know as we're all coming out of this pandemic that has you know a million people one in 350 people in the united states of america roughly have lost a loved one yes and and that's huge and so it's painful but it's nice to have resources you know like at heaven's door there's others as well that that can let people know when they're ready some other stories Yes. about that are research-based about what could possibly be happening here what is death really we have we have we are illiterate as a culture around death yes illiterate and so the literature that we need to uh bring into the mainstream are the research-based literature that tells stories from reasonable people in their own words and it becomes uh, an iterative process of one person hearing a story, getting curious, reading more, learning more, hearing other stories, sharing it with friends, talking about her friends. And what you find in this process is that people have had these experiences. Yes, exactly. They're not just something in a book for a small portion of society. 
They're everywhere. Right. Everywhere. People come up to me all the time and they say, hey, I heard about your book, then I read about, then I read it. I had this experience, mm -hmm. you know, and when I read your book, I realized that I had this experience that I didn't even realize. So they're there, even in people who think that they haven't had these experiences. Many of them have had them. That's so, so true. Yeah. Well, William, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, is there anything that you'd like to, to say before we, before we close? Yeah, I mean, I would, I thank you. I mean, I would encourage people to have conversations about what they've heard today in our dialogue here today. As you know, it's been mostly me talking about the shared death experience, but really bringing this, this topic into, uh, into your conversations with the people you care about, your intimate yes. relationships, because you're going to be surprised. People think about this and people have heard stories. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we do have a story library. And uh, you can hear videos, firsthand accounts in videos on our website, sharedcrossing.com. Go to the story library and you'll hear stories. We have probably eight or nine up right now. We re-rotate them. And uh, so people can hear normal people like you and I sharing these stories. Wow. And then, of course, I've talked a little bit about our courses. You know, if you're interested, our courses, people just love them because it's it's just a place to come and talk with and engage with conscious, you know, courageous people that are on the vanguard of consciousness, conscious mm -hmm. people having conscious conversations about this experience of transition at the end of life that we're all going to have. Yes. And so, so there's that as well. And, you know, if other people, you know, you know, join our mailing list because we do announce other great events and, Eventually, you know, they'll be able to, you know, you'll have this on your own website, but, you know, many interviews I do like this, and there's a whole catalog of, of those as well. So lots of different ways to learn and, and follow us on our handles, Facebook and Yes, Instagram. and what are those? How would people find you? Well, they're just, you know, Shared Crossing Project mm -hmm. at, uh, on Facebook and Instagram. And we're also on Twitter and LinkedIn. So, um, so yeah. I think that's it. I mean, we're trying to develop a community here and you're helping us with this, Marla. So I appreciate it. Absolutely. It's such important work. Thank you. And, and your book, it's just, it's, it's amazing. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with the world. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I thank you. Yeah, it was, a, it was a labor of love. And I love when I hear people who were touched by it. Yes, uh, yes. Well, thank you so much, William. And have a great rest of the evening. And really, really, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you, Marla. Been a pleasure being with you. Thank you. Bye-bye.